We have an amazing program today. I hope you are as excited as I am, but I doubt it. Um, it is my absolute privilege to welcome to Talks at Google, Mr. John Waters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So welcome. I, here we I, are. <laughs> here we are. I'd love to think that you just happened to be in the neighborhood and wanted to drop by. Well, we I was in Google and Cambridge yesterday. OK. Yeah, so I'm touring Google everywhere. <laughs> I, I, well, we're delighted. But, um, but this is an actually a, a very special day. Your new book drops today. I know. It actually is the pub day today. And I'm so know how long it takes for a project. It took three years for this book to write and to research it and everything. So it's always people forget every, uh, I talked with Michael Cunningham, an old friend of mine yesterday, and he said, whenever I'm in a bookshop, I look at every book, good, bad, and I think each one of these person went through this long process, got it published. It's kind of amazing and how many books come out that get noticed. Yeah. Um, and this, the book, by the way, Mr. Know-It-All, The Tarnished Wisdom of a Filth Elder. <laughs> now that's the galley. It comes in hardback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the very dog-eared galley. I yeah. have enjoyed this book Thank so, you so much. much. Thank um, you. And this is so. This is your ninth book, is it? I think it probably is. But a couple of them were screenplay books, and uh, one was a book about contemporary art. So um, I think first was Shock Value, which was kind of my memoirs about making the early films, and then Crackpot, which was a lot of journalism I did for Rolling Stone and a lot of places then. And then uh, Role Models was about all the people that really influenced me when I was a child to give me the example of who I could be myself. And then Car Sick was my book where I hitchhiked across America by myself when I was 66 years old, which I think you all should do. You're all too young. People don't even know what hitchhiking is. They're, they're, it, I only saw one the whole time I hitchhiked across America. In and New York, it's like, it's like hailing a cab well, that isn't York, there. I did hitchhike to promote it for New York Magazine. I had a sign that said the Frick museum <laughs> and I got a ride up and then coming home a limo stopped with a woman in the back and she gave me the limo to take me home and she went to work <laughs> so that's what hitchhiking in New York is like right. that is right. the single most New York yeah, thing yeah, I've yeah, heard yeah. <laughs> wow so so having put all of these out there and then this book for three years, and I can understand where that much research went into it. It is a treasure trove. Um, what was the impetus for this book? Well, I just like to tell stories, you know, and I wanted the book to sound like I'm just sitting with you and telling you a story from beginning to end. But that takes about six drafts to get that done. And uh, so I, it was just all the stories I had in me that I hadn't told yet, really. And uh, Shock Value ended right before we made Polyester. So this has maybe six or seven chapters of Polyester to each movie up till the end. But then I have chapters on the most hideous foodie restaurant I want to open called gristle that has, <laughs> that has food that no one could dare eat, right? And how I want to rebuild my whole house in brutalism so the neighbors would be offended. <laughs> and then I tell you how to really tell someone you love them without emotional risk. And then I tell everybody at the end how to beat death. <laughs> it's... I, I, I think you've nailed it exactly. Reading this book, it is very much like you f you're sitting at the end of the bar with John. You've both had a few. And then this is the transcript. Um, I never wrote drunk, though. I don't think, well, I guess, what's his name did? He made a whole career out of that. Who, Hemingway? No, well, him, oh. yeah. <laughs> but did he write when he was drunk? That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, like, people saw in my early movies, oh, well, you must have been on drugs when you made, well, yes, we were. But not, <laughs> not when we made the movies, but when I thought them up. I thought them up on pot, mm -hmm. but I didn't, we weren't on pot making them. We could have never gotten through those 20-hour days. And, well, and craft and services also, would have been so in expensive. in this book, there's one stunt I did do that's sort of equal to hitchhiking, the last one. I took really strong LSD again at 70 years old, not like you all with your microchip. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> so yeah, let's let's talk about that. So you wap, and wap, 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 wap. <laughs> the one thing I forgot is that phlegm taste in the back of your throat when it starts to come on. Like, uh oh, I forgot. <laughs> I haven't done this in fifty years. <laughs> There's such a, a, a telling, like, either recollection and reverberation in the room or people who are just like, hmm. Well, most of you all, when, see, I, my mother always said, don't tell young people to do drugs. I don't, you all, I'm not telling you to, I'm telling old people to take acid. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones that need EK. We're not having a senior moment. We're tripping. <laughs> and I, I did it with Mink Stoll, who's been my friend for 50 years, and we took it 50 years ago together. It was the last time we ever took it. So. Um, um, it, and it was really strong, and I, I spent months trying to get the pure, I got it basically from Timothy Leary's asshole. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it took that long for me to get it. And it was much purer than what I remember even when I was a kid. We used to steal it from Sandoz Hospital because they treated alcoholics with it. And Shepherd Pratt Hospital in Baltimore, they used it to treat alcoholism. I think they might still do it. but. Uh, we did this in 1964, and it wasn't even illegal until 1967. And I always liked drugs. Nothing bad happened to me, though. I'm not like other people that took drugs and ruined their whole life, and that does happen, certainly. Uh, so I just was a drug enthusiast. I was never a, a drug <laughs> addict, really. And nothing bad ever happened to me because of drugs. I mean, heroin, I tried once. I thought, oh, I'm not a jazz musician. I don't need this. <laughs> Sitting around nodding and puking wasn't my idea of a fun night, but fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, the experience that you describe in doing that with, uh, with Mink and, and you had another friend a there. Friend, my friend Frankie, who's kind of like a really good artist at town, a young guy that, that both Mink and I knew, but they, they weren't involved. It wasn't mm -hmm. either of our boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, anything mm -hmm. like that. So it was just the three of us. And before we sort of held hands in the corners, where Mink just said, if anybody finds God, please keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a reasonable request in yeah, general. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we played all the same music that I used to play when I used to trip with Divine, who used to come out and do Dion Warwick's Once in a Lifetime and lip sync it. It still sounded good. And we played all the Fellini soundtracks. They and then the corniest of all the soundtrack, the born free as the free as the wind blows. And it was so hilarious when we were on acid that we were like rolling on the floor <laughs> laughing. If people would come in, they would have called the mental institution, right? <laughs> but we didn't have a guide. Do you remember what that was? Oh, yes. The, we never had them. We made fun of that. And Divine, I think, in Multiple Maniacs, attacks normal people and drops a net on them and give, shoots them up with acid and said, I'll be your guide. <laughs> but uh, and I did know people that shot up acid in the 60s, which is really shocking to just pull that and you're t full tripping. Oh, God. I need a little time to work up to it. Yeah. I, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, it was. Wow. Yeah. I would recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> but so th this is a great example because reading this, uh, the passage about um, about taking LSD, um, it's amazing. You're such a beautiful writer. Like this is, oh, it's you. really. It's my sentimental poetic. chapter in a way because. It, it's really about friendship, about Mink and I being friends for 50 years, and we've gone through a lot. We were estranged at one point. Everything, you know, mm -hmm. battle. She's been in all my movies. And all the audience that have grown up in my movies grew up with Mink, you know, and I'm still really, really good friends with her. I don't trust people that haven't had old friends. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps you sane. That's even more than family or anything. At the end, that's all you've got to uh, count on in the end. So when people say, I don't really have any old friends, I think, what's the matter with you? You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 pardon me, as I thought, the sentimental chapter for me was the, the letter to your son. Oh, that one. I have this, <laughs> I don't have children, <laughs> but I do have a son that was a reborn baby. It's one of these things that they make them really seriously, and you have to get an adoptive mother to make it. And they take this baby doll, they take its skin off, they put real hair 
eyeballs, everything. And I think people adopt them and pretend they're their real babies. So I couldn't talk to the woman with a straight face. So my assistant did, and she said, well, he was like an angry baby with bad hair. And, and then I got the baby, and it took it. It's so scary looking. And it has moisture on its lip. And it has a penis. And I was afraid to look, because I'm not a pedophile, right? And like, but I said, is it circumcised? And she said, it's not. And I said, well, I'm a Catholic American. I would like it to be circumcised. She went, well. Then she called back real seriously. The operation was a success. <laughs> And so this is a letter to my son Bill just telling him that I know it's hard to sit in that chair for the rest of his life in my living room, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is what you have to do. Right. Yeah, yeah. Did you get to keep the, the, the foreskin? No, I didn't. I, and I only looked at it once because yeah. that's his job. Sure, that's sure. His, you know, that's his business. I do have in the book that if his hands, I know he has sexual needs, but at the, maybe they'll, his hand is, is near it, so uh -huh. maybe if there's an earthquake. Ah. Oh, that's just a little. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you really got to move him to California. He's getting into his <laughs> yeah, teens. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> My mother hated him so much. She'd walk in and see it. Go, oh, put that damn thing away because it's really scary looking. And all my pothead friends always said, it moved. <laughs> it didn't move. Well, maybe they're just getting really good stuff. Maybe. Um, so the um, I also have to call out, because I can't wait for this on the audiobook, the chapter you do for Andy Warhol. That was hard to read uh, in the audiobook because it's one run-on sentence. It's called the, Run On Andy, that I kind of wanted to really stick up for Andy, because I'm sick of movies and everything. Why is he the villain and everything all of a sudden? So it's very much me sticking up for him, but I wanted to kind of mock kind of the way he did a, an album, I mean, a novel called A, and all it was was they just turned on the tape recorder and talked on speed, and then he didn't edit one thing out. Not, uh, the, it was almost impossible to read. So I wanted to do the same kind of experimental writing kind of thing. So it's one long run-on sentence about everything I feel about Warhol. Yeah, I think this is like 12 pages that ultimately is like nine sentences. Yeah. Yeah. It was right. hard to read. You had to take a big, you know, big <laughs> gulp of air before you started that paragraph. Right. Or speed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm too old for speed. God. I remember used to taking it, looking in the ice box and looking at the ice cube saying, cold in there? How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, it, it is an, an amazing book that reads like travel log, how to, memoir. Um, it will change you. We have a dirty chapter, too. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You always have to have a dirty chapter in the book. Yeah. Um, and a little bit of a great the, the sort of dirty history of, uh, of, of New York. Of the sex bars in New York, yeah, yeah, yeah which uh, you all can't imagine what it used to be like. And I'm not saying it was better or worse, but it's the opposite of today, where here at work you can't say to each other, nice dress. You have to get a counselor to come in, right, after you've said that. <laughs> but um, in, in those days, people had sex with somebody different every single night. And that was really not odd, you know. And I look back on that and think, God, what a, it's the exact opposite of the swinging sick. 60s mm -hmm. today, and both extremes are a little much, I think. So this begs the question, as, as we're getting the wisdom from a filth elder, yeah. what is this, what, what, I guess I was going to say, what is the state of filth now? But maybe even what is filth is a better question. Well, filth is, you know, when they had the camp ball at the Met, I thought, who says the word camp anymore? I don't know. <laughs> even the oldest queen I know doesn't say that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, I thought, uh, then it became trash, and then filth was more, more of a punk rock word, so mm -hmm. I think it has more of an edge. But I think it's all just become American comedy now. All the mm -hmm. stuff that we did is now on television, is the, is the kind of comedy that started when I was young with, as Trump called Mayor Pete, Alfred E. Newman. I want him to be president, mm -hmm. because he was the first rebellious thing I ever knew as a kid for Mad Magazine. And uh, so he led to Lenny Bruce, and mm -hmm. without Lenny Bruce, none of this would happen. And mm -hmm. you forget that Lenny Bruce went to jail for saying the word fuck on stage. So imagine, now it's on network television. Yeah. yeah. So things have changed. Is that better? It is better. Yeah. <coughs> you don't go to jail. But I remember it was fun when you would go see the movie Flaming Creatures in the East Village and they would raid the theater and take the audience to jail. <laughs> that's a night at the movies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
it should have some yeah. skin in the game. Yeah. 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 <laughs> is there, so you say that you think ultimately it's, we're better for maybe as a society for less filth. But are we artistically better for it? Oh, there's still great movies being made. There's, anybody see Gaspar Noe's Climax? Oh, I love that movie. I mean, that's a shocker. It is a shocker. And uh, there's still Todd Salance makes movies I really mm -hmm. love. Bruno Dumont. I always like feel bad foreign movies, you know, <laughs> the, especially French ones. So, yeah. so if, they're, if you're the filth elder, are they more like the filth progeny? Well, no, I don't think that actually all the reviews I ever read when somebody said it's a John Waters-esque movie, I usually hate that movie. Movie. Mm -hmm. Because what it means is it's gross, or, but they're trying too hard. And I was always trying to use Shock Bay to make you change your mind and see something in a different way. It's easy to repulse people and shock people. Even the eating shit and pink flamingos, that was done to comment. That was the year Deep Throat became legal, when pornography became legal. What is left? What can't you do? And it was not illegal to eat shit then. It is now. <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> Community values, you know, when we, Pink Flamingos, every time it got arrested, which was many times, we lost every time in court. And the Museum of Modern Art bought a print, and I thought, well, this will do it. They were not impressed, the juries. Because at midnight, it's a happy experience. At 10 a.m. in a courtroom, it is obscene when you watch it. <laughs> it just depends where you're seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I realized that. So we just paid the fine. It was cheaper than the lawyer. Hmm. <laughs> but that leads us to, I mean, you just spoke at Lincoln Center. And, I uh, did. With yeah. a, no, I got the French Medal of Honor. That was the best for, for uh, <laughs> futuring the arts in France, which was great. And uh, I got the Writers Guild of America, a Lifetime Achievement Award. So all these things are great. It's like, to me now, it doesn't even matter at my funeral. I heard all the nice things people would say. That's already <laughs> happened. So that's good, too. All right. So then let's. Shifting a little bit, but so three years working on this book, which is now, you know, again, the ninth book that you put out, um, your films are you know, being re-released and being you know, lauded all over. Well, you not are, always. Not by all, but yes, by some. When right? you hit Criterion Collection no, and they're BFI. Great. That's the ultimate irony. Right, right. <laughs> and you're doing visual arts and having gallery right. shows. And you're doing at least one traveling live performance every year. I do in two different cities. versions. Yeah, the fil this filthy world and the John Waters Christmas. I have a summer camp that's in uh, Kent, Connecticut, every year. Which have you been to it? It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> the people that come and they all stay friends all year and everything. It's really it's like Jonestown with a happy ending. <laughs> I hope that's on the T-shirt. Uh, it is. Yeah. It is on the T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a phenomenal pace for any artist, and especially in this many mediums. Like, not to be trite, but like, how do you do it? How well, I don't know. People always say to me, how, how do I not do it? You know, I like what I'm doing, and mm -hmm. you know, how long are you going to live? You want to do everything you can while you're alive. You want to read every book. You want to see every music. You want to find out about every new thing. That's why I have youth spies, people your age, that <laughs> tell me things, and I give them poppers or drinks or something. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to tell me things. I can't go to a rap bar at 4 AM. But if you tell me about it, well, then you get a reward. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm sure we, we can probably get somebody who will build I a website for this program. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wish I had a hacker boyfriend. They stay home. They have bad posture. But they do stay home. <laughs> Shooting their load on Silk Road. No, I'm sorry. I know you can't say that kind of shit here. But, but anyway. It's actually the Silk Road part. Silk that Road's gone. With. Yeah. <laughs> but the new dark web, I, I kind of am fascinated by it. You know, that's the new juvenile delinquent, is the one that's living with his parents, is 35 years old, they haven't seen him in two months, and they leave food outside of his or her door, and they're shutting down the government. Yeah, that's, a, <laughs> that's the new juvenile delinquent. And they're having just as much fun as I did when we stole hubcaps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> You may have encouraged the wrong part of our audience, but we'll see where it goes. I thought you'd hire them. Yeah. And well, thank you. Uh, so, you know, 
hackers and shutting down the government. This, uh, you talk a little bit in the book about sort of activism and, and the way you've done that through art. I mean, this is going back to Pat Nixon and Patty Hearst. Well, I remember when they were going to sneak uh, acid into Patricia Nixon. No, we did a movie. Well, no, the, the Coquettes did a movie called Trisha's Wedding that was mm -hmm. exactly, it was all drag queens getting married the day her real wedding took place, and they filmed it at the same time. See, that kind of humorous terrorism is something that we did in the 60s where you embarrass the enemy and you make them look like fools. That's what we need again. Because all this ranting, like all the Democratic candidates, all of them, they're preaching. And they're all going to fight each other about things like, should the Boston bomber be allowed to vote? Oh, give me a break. You know, they're going to destroy each other. They're going to fight with each other all the time to get the nomination. And then he's going to win again. Um, <laughs> so on that point, yeah. what? What is the role of art, and especially subversive, filthy art? Well, in I the don't know if it's climate. the role of art. It's the role of young people. Is to get out in the streets and protest and change things. And 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 it's weird though because when I grew up, Berkeley was like kind of anybody free speech, and now they stop people from speaking there mm -hmm. that they don't agree with, which I don't agree with. I, I, I feel bad once in my life when Agnew was running. We went and did the same thing. Every time he spoke, we screamed so he couldn't talk. And even then, I felt like, wait a minute, you know, this isn't right. He should be able to talk, even if you don't agree with him. I, I'm for the extremes of free speech. <laughs> the same way there is pornography that's obscene. But maybe we have to have it to have a don't buy it. Don't look at it. But, I, but some extremes of what people say. Now, hate speech is a different thing. I guess. I, I don't know where the line is. And when the American Civil Liberties Union march was said that the Nazis had the right to march, well, that's an extreme. But maybe we have to have the extremes to keep everybody free. All right. Interesting. Do you, I mean, and this is, this is prime time. We are this year the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Yeah. Um, and you were you in New York at the time? You yeah, were but right I was. About I was. Um, Stonewall was. You know, it was a good book because it was like prostitutes and hustlers and stuff. It wasn't an upscale gay bar and everything. Mm. And I love that it was Judy Garland died that day. One of the most <laughs> cliche reasons <laughs> to have a riot. Uh, <laughs> that's like so unbelievable to me. That sparked it. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, but I must admit, when I first went to a gay bar in Washington, it was called the Chicken Hut. And it was really old school queens with t phones on every table. And the phone would ring and pick it up and say, hey, I'd like to buy you a drink. I thought, I might be queer, but I'm not this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I wanted Bohemia, which is what I was looking for. And, and uh, now I think that I like young people. They don't want to be gay or straight. I mean, I'm against separatism. Mm -hmm. I think choosing a side's so 2018 that, um, <laughs> that I think you should come in, come out, do anything you want, you know, and I think young people don't want to be classified as one thing. Mm -hmm. And everybody's so uptight, gay bars are vanishing. I'm not. I mean, it's like, uh, it's, it's segregating yourself. I don't want my book just in the gay section near mm -hmm. true crime back by the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I want it up front. So then do you think like that now that there are there are so many labels. There are so many ways to be and, and to identify. Um, is that a help or a hindrance to that? Well, there's some I heard about, autosexuals. And this mm -hmm. is the thing where they ask people, the people that prefer masturbation. Well. Mm -hmm rather than sex with other people. Isn't that everybody, really? Right. But, but, but for efficiency's they, sake, yes. They feel that if they have sex with someone else, they have been unfaithful to themselves. Come on, give me a break. And then, and then echosexuals, you know about them? They lick and kiss flowers. They, they bury themselves in mud nude while people dance around them chanting sexual stuff. Give me a break, too. You know, and, and adult babies, I ain't marching for them. <laughs> I have limits. Yeah. Although I get the appeal. If you can just lay there and I can get I nothing. Don't. <laughs> I don't. If I ever went home with somebody and they were sitting there in a bouncy chair when you went, oh, God, God. I think in no. a long enough timeline, we're all going to end up in diapers. You might as well yeah, fetishize well, it now. Well, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm liberal. You can do that. <laughs> so um, a, uh, 
a question that I'd asked a lot of my friends. I'm like, I'm going to interview John Waters. And one of the questions that a friend submitted, uh, hi, John. The, uh, you've worked in so many mediums. You've done visual arts. You've been a director. You've been a screenwriter, an author, doing stand-up. Like, in all of these, what, what has been the best medium for connecting to the audience and telling truth? Not, all, not your favorite, but the no, best. It's all I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. I've never made a movie I didn't write. I do my spoken word shows. I, everything is I write. That's mm -hmm. the thing. Even the artwork is written first and then like kind of edited. So um, it's always about writing. To me, the most fun is thinking it up. Mm -hmm. So to me, it doesn't matter if I'm writing a book or making a movie or I'm doing here today as I'm telling you stories. And I just need a way to always do that. And a long time ago, I learned you have to have alternate choices. When one movie doesn't work, they're not going to give it to you well. So you do this and you do this. Always be back. Don't let it, don't get stuck. Don't get, don't go backwards either. That's something that's really important. And a no is free. Ask for what you want. So what if they say no? It's free. It doesn't hurt. It does hurt, but you get used to it. In show business, you've got to get used to rejection anyway. Because it's like hitchhiking. You only need one car to stop. If everybody stopped, it's a traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> So many t-shirt worthy things. <laughs> oh, wow. The so, one I had with the Strand bookstore took everything without me knowing it and opened a gift shop. I said, if you don't, if you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't fuck them. But now, <laughs> I have a new one. If you go home with somebody and they have books in the bathroom, don't fuck them. <laughs> that is disgusting. A big basket of Us magazines next to the toilet. Oh, my God. <laughs> We're, we're purely phone people here. Uh, but then phone sex, I don't know how you act butch. Do you misspell? Yeah. I, I think we're working on a whole slate of butch right. emojis. I just um, never use poor English or I don't know. I'm just trying to think. <laughs> So you're talking about being essentially it all boiling down to being a storyteller. Are are the stories just constantly coming, or is this like this curated pin of stories you were born with? And Both. They're developed. <laughs> They're, okay. They're developed. And I have a spoken word show that I constantly have to update. So right. I'm constantly rewriting them, and I have to. That's why I don't understand why anybody would put anything on Twitter. You just give all your material away for free. What would I put in my books? <laughs> uh, so, But at the same time, um, they are developed, but different ideas come to me, and then they mutate into something else. And you know, just like any writer does, they just have lots of little cubicles you throw ideas in. Are you a disciplined creator? Like, this is the time I sit and write? Or yep. yeah. Every day, 8 AM, Monday to Friday. And, and at 7.59, I thought, I'm not doing this. I have to make the bed. I have to change this. And then it, I'm doing it at 8.01, and then I'm lost in it. So walk us through. Monday what, to what, Friday. What does that Monday to Friday look like? What's that? Day? Every day I get up, I read six newspapers that get delivered. I don't, no writer doesn't read the New York Post. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the best headline they ever have is when Ike Turner died, and it was, Ike beats Tina to death. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Pulitzer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I read the papers, I look at all my emails, and then I go to work. And everybody knows never to call me. I don't look at my computer, I don't have my phone on, I don't answer the phone. So everybody, all my friends, Monday to Friday, mm -hmm. knows never to call me then. And then when that's over, then I meet with my people that work for me and we run my business. All right. So are, is there a, <laughs> all right, here's the next landmark. I haven't done this and I want to. Or opportunities find you? Well, I do. The next thing I'm writing, I signed a two book deal on this one that was to write a novel, which I've never done, even though in Carsick, the first two parts of it were me imagining the worst that could happen and the best. So that was fiction, except I was in it, which mm -hmm. makes it a lot easier. And the movies are all fiction, but I've never actually written a novel. So I'm in the middle of writing that now. So that's a new one okay. that I haven't done, yeah. All right. So. And what else is left? Um, I don't know, hairspray on ice? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, ice capades, I could see I being a real big head. I know. Like, yeah. but uh, I made that joke on Letterman, and then, then they called the next day and said, yes, we're interested. I was making a joke. <laughs> yeah. May everyone get to that point. But it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't okay. happened. Um, and then 
so downtime, you you talk about what, what a no vacation is. No, I have downtime. I don't work on weekends, and um, I have a social life. You know, I'm proud to say that half my dinner receipts are not tax deductible, <laughs> which means you have a personal life. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Um, and I live in Baltimore. I have an apartment in New York, San Francisco. I live in Provincetown in the summer, and I'm on the road half the time. So um, I can get around. Yeah. Sounds like <laughs> a, a, a reasonable balance. Yeah. Um, I want to take, I, I know there was another question that a friend sent. If you were a filmmaker starting now, what medium would you be using and how? Of course, I'd make one on my phone, just like all the kids do, and they'd use their friends just like I did. It's still the same thing. The difference is Hollywood is looking for the next kid that's making his film on a cell phone. They weren't looking for me at that time. You know, They wouldn't have anything to do with that. But now they are, certainly, and they'd blow it up spend $300,000 to make it look more professional, put all music in you don't want, mm -hmm. and then give you a job directing a $40 million Hollywood movie and your career would be over when it bombed. <laughs> OK. That those, happens sometimes. Those of you taking notes at home, that is the art. Um, we also have some, uh, a mic set up, so we're going to start lining up for audience questions. And already, there's people coming forward. All right. Hi. Uh, thanks Hi. for coming back to New York. Saw you here a couple years ago. Uh, I just watched uh, the episode of RuPaul's Drag Race where you were a guest judge. I was, yeah. And I was wondering if you could tell us any stories, salacious or not, from set well, or anything relevant. I just relevant? remember, I knew RuPaul forever, you know, way a long time ago when he was starting out. And he's, I think the big key to his great success, and he has great success, is that he also has a great look as a man. And most drag queens do not. <laughs> and he has a great look as a man. And, uh, and when I did the show, I was just amazed because they did all my movies and stuff. And I was just seeing them like, oh my god, when they did Pink Flamingos and stuff. So it was a, it was a great tribute to me. And I, I was excited by the whole thing and being on that show. And you know, people still come over to me in airports. Of course, they saw that. Little children come over to me because I was in the Alvin the Chipmunk movie. <laughs> And they say, pick me up, can't pick you up. I look like a child molester. I can't pick you up. And I like to say weird things, inappropriate things, like, got any cigarettes? <laughs> My favorite to say to a child is, have you ever seen the dead? Thank you. <laughs> and these kids probably don't know how you really feel about Alvin and the Chipmunks. Well, I liked Alvin. I, I've always loved Alvin and the Chipmunks, for real. You know, I write about him in the book. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Alvin got his star recently on Hollywood Boulevard, and they asked me to do a little video tribute, which I did. And I was in the Alvin and the Chipmunk movie. It was my bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 the it only seemed thing like... left is I want to be in the next Final Destination movie. <laughs> That could take well, it into a whole other. Well, it could happen. Yeah, it yeah. Um, you have stronger feelings for Alvin, from what I understand. Well, I used to be sexually attracted to Alvin, but yeah. then, and, and the original animators at Disney that did Alvin <laughs> sent me a cell they did of Alvin <laughs> masturbating. <laughs> And I have it in my bathroom. Right? <laughs> and I'm sure Disney or whoever would not be thrilled no. that they did that. Yeah, I've no. never shown it to the Alvin representatives no. I know. Either, uh, right? I would not. Oh my God. Yeah. But you know where a chipmunk stores its nuts now. Well, well yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Hi, John. Thanks for Hi. coming. Um, I heard you on Terry Gross yesterday talking about how you've always been drawn to people who are the exact opposite of you. Yeah. And I'm wondering, who is that now, and how do you spend time with them? Well, I like people. That's why I live in Baltimore, because everybody I know is not in show business. They're not writers. They're not. They, some of them are like undertakers or truck drivers, or they have real lives that I want to know about, because I know about the world I'm in. I don't want to just hear the same old stories about, oh, isn't a terrible turnaround, what a high class problem, you know. But when you hear somebody else's problems of people that are the opposite of you, I, I kind of just like it. I like to be around the people that are opposite of me. That's why I always used to hang out in this 
straight biker bar in Baltimore. <laughs> and it was real ones. Like, you know, and they used to take me to their clubhouses. And it was like so Scorpio rising. But they were, they, were, they, were, they were really great to me. And they'd say, want any girls? You can pick one out. And there's mats upstairs. And they knew. They were just fucking with me. <laughs> But uh, they were great. And I used to go out with them in Baltimore sometimes and just walk in about like two Hells Angels in the full outfits. And they were so wonderful, though. They were nice. And I, I still liked them. And when one died, my sister-in-law did a whole big funeral arrangement of a skull. That got me brownie points forever. That looked so great at the funeral. So I like to be around people that I would maybe not be initially thought of be accepted by for some reason, just to see what that world is like, a world I don't know. Well, this happened in the, the when in your hitchhiking journey. As well, the hitchhiking, Bible. I met a lot of people that were different than me, but they were very optimistic. All the all the men, no gay person picked me up hitchhiking the whole way. But all the heterosexual men did talked about how much they loved their wives. And so I always say all the women I know say, I never meet any straight man. Everyone's gay. Go hitchhike in the Midwest. <laughs> And you will find the man of your dreams, really. Yeah. Well, you, this 20-something Republican councilman, yeah. Brett Beidel? Is yeah, that? I don't know if he's still a Republican. I was in his wedding last year. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is after he picked me up hitchhiking and took me to California. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he was a Republican elected official. And he was great, though. He just picked me up hitchhiking, didn't have any idea who I was. And then we just kept talking. He drove me to Ohio, and his mother's car was freaking out, because I'm not Google friendly <laughs> to parents when you look up the first thing pops up, friends with Manson family. <laughs> Gay man of the year. Oh, great. You know, uh, my son just picked him up hitchhiking in there in Ohio. Not a good sign. Yeah. But it seems like you made a good impression. I'm glad oh, you're out great. there repping us. And then he came all the way back and picked me up in Denver. And then his parents really freaked out. And, uh, but he was great. And then I met the mother at the dinner. She said, Well, wouldn't you freak out if you know, he had my car and he's in California with you? Yeah, she had a point. She's. <laughs> But it was completely innocent, completely innocent, yeah. Hi, I have a question about writing projects in general. Yeah. Do you ever find that you're really passionate about a particular story and it's not working? Like, at what point do you know, okay, this is a trash idea, I need to get rid of it or keep working Well, through? that's a good thing to do. I, I made a mistake of that early in my career when I was trying to make the sequel to Pink Flamingos and nobody would make it, and it went on. If it's not going to happen after a while, it's not going to happen. Don't get stuck. You can, you can reject something. Um, and I have, uh, Patrick White was a great, I tried to buy Ingmar Bergman's trash can when he died because I wanted to have it in my office to throw all my bad ideas in the <laughs> same one that Ingmar Bergman did. But it went for like $35,000. And it was just an Ikea trash can. It didn't have Ingmar written on it or anything. <laughs> So then I like Patrick White, the Australian writer. So I was doing a tour of Australia, and I sent to the guy who was the head of his, uh, what do you call it, his family, you know, the trust. Did he have the trash can? So they said, yes, we'll give you his trash can, but you have to will it back to us when you die. So I now throw all my ideas into Patrick White's trash can. So <laughs> it's, it's, you should have a good place for your bad ideas, and then you won't be afraid to throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> Oh, please. Uh, so you like Baltimore? Seems. I do. It's, we got edge. <laughs> what do you down. <laughs> um, and you also know about the Silk Road, so I'm wondering what you think about the, the ransomware attack that's shutting down the Baltimore well, government right now. Did you now. do it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is amazing they can't sell a house or anything. And uh, it is shut down still, but you can't call 311 either. You can't complain about people or anything. So uh, it, it is kind of amazing, and that's happening all the time. And I think some cities did pay, right? Wasn't it just easier to pay $60,000? It wasn't that high. Of course, in Baltimore, that's a lot. Because <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had insurance. But it is certainly the wave of the future. That's going to happen all the time, you know? And, uh, and so. Yes, it's still going on, and I think it's really hard to, uh, to fix it or to ever find out who did it. So yeah, it's, it's happening right now. I'm hoping all my parking tickets get lost. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke a minute ago about being friends with the Manson family. Well, no, I was joking about that a little, right. because I did fight, and still do, for one of them to be released on parole, who's been in jail for 50 years. And she got parole. I wrote about her a lot in Role Models, and she got 
the last three pro things, they said yes for her to be out. She's been for 50 years. She looks back on it with horror and sorrow. She's helped people for 50 years. She's a completely different person than the 19-year-old girl that met a madman of the biggest madman pimp of our time in the 1969, the most insane year of the century. And, uh, but the governor turns her down every time. And see, there's only three states in the country where they can do that, Maryland, Oklahoma, and California, where the government can turn it down. And then because of the case, what governor is going to let any of them out? And, uh, and she really does deserve it, I think. But I understand victims' rights people feeling the opposite. And, uh, so, and I taught in prison for a long time. Well, that's and what I, I wanted to ask I about did, you. I did get one out of jail in Baltimore that's doing really great, a double murder that's doing really well, really well. Um, he bought a house. He's, he really does great. So um, I do believe in rehabilitation, <laughs> but some aren't. <laughs> there are some people that shouldn't be. You make one mistake and everybody, you know, let them, everybody else pays. So you, but you've done a lot of advocacy work for prisoners for a while. I used to more because now it's, they don't have that in jail anymore. They don't have schools. It's much worse to be in jail now. And by the way, Camilla, what's her name, Harris? Mm -hmm. She's the enemy of all prison rights. So she made it in California, passed the law where parole went from five years to 10 or 15. She is the enemy of prisoners' rights. So I just wanted to put that in your head. <laughs> What drew you to that work? Well, I always, people that were the opposite of me, mm -hmm. in a way, or experience I could never ma imagine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I am not a violent person ever. So mm -hmm. to imagine what causes this or what, what, and there is no fair answer, obviously. Mm -hmm. If somebody kills somebody, what is the fair answer? I think the only answer is you can, your whole life you have to spend trying to become a better person than you would have been if that hadn't happened. That's all you can do, really, to make up for it. So I'm interested in un, unsolvable questions. It's amazing because I think that a lot of people who have celebrity and have a voice want to shine a light on the issue. Very few go into the prison and sit down with people. I'll tell you who does do that now. Of somebody that I, was, I refused to know who she was. But now she is getting prisoners out is the Kardashian. I refuse to know who she was. Every time I saw the article, I wouldn't read it. Yeah. But she goes in women's prison. She does help people get out. With Trump. What, can you yeah. imagine? Right, I know. You know. They say only Nixon could go to China. There's yeah. some people that yeah. are the right person for yeah. the job. Yeah. Yeah. And my friend was in the jail where she came. She said she was dressed very properly. She hmm. didn't wear full, you know. <laughs> Nude, basically. She yeah. <laughs> chose not to be nude. At the... It was more business casual yeah, for yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned art and activism, and one of my favorite things that you've ever done is Homer's Phobia, that Simpsons episode. Thank you. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Were you involved in the writing of it at no, all? No, I was just in it, and they called me. So it isn't really something I did, except I agreed to do it. They wrote the script and everything, you know, and I was thrilled to be asked to be on The Simpsons in any way. And then when I read the script, I thought, wow, this is pretty strong for at that time uh, yeah. on for television, certainly for kids too. And that episode has been shown forever and ever and ever and ever. And so I'm proud to be on that. Little kids do come over to me in airports from that too. <laughs> so, um, so I'm happy for that. That was a fluke in a way. You know, it, it came out and uh, you know, only Elizabeth Taylor and Michael Jackson did it twice. They haven't asked me to do it again. <laughs> There's still hope. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That is, I, I would be saying this even if you weren't here. One of the all time best episodes. Thank you very much. Thank if, you. Uh, and also, for calling out Marge's curtains. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I have the I, same I like ones the in line. my bathroom. Really, I like the line when I said, all steel workers are gay. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Took another question. Yeah, no one else is asking questions, so. Uh, this is a John Waters talk, so what's the best drug to have sex on? <laughs> Poppers. <laughs> because it only lasts a couple minutes. <laughs> so, and I haven't done poppers alone. I used to do them on roller coasters at Coney Island, going up that hill. <laughs> now, now, most of our audience thinks you're talking about cheese stuffed jalapenos. No, poppers are a little rush. It's called, uh, you know. <laughs> and you have to, and really, I'm for proper education in the grade schools because. <laughs> I, 
I passed them to a young man, and he drank them. He didn't know what to do with them. It's never too young to teach our children about poppers. That PSA is being edited right now. Um, you did an excellent art piece of Ralph Poppers. I did Rush. a big bottle of Rush. And the guy from the head of the Rush company liked it so much, he sent me a lifetime supply of Rush. <laughs> and I'm out of them. <laughs> and he committed suicide. Well, listen. I know. So it was just a his lifetime Rush, supply. I never found out. That would be horrible, just like the overdose of Rush. Oh, God. But, uh, I don't know what happened. It was his lifetime supply. I guess. But I gave them away. It wasn't like I did them all. You know, I was like, and I used to have this popper party in Provincetown every summer when the Provincetown Film Festival was going on, and it was totally underground. But I saw major Academy Award winners, critics from the top newspapers, all doing poppers. And then one the Boston Globe outed me. They wrote about it. And the entire town crashed the party like the like Mother. Did you see that movie? Yes. <laughs> That's what it was like. And I never had it again. Right. Yeah. Why we can't have nice things. Um, <laughs> so we know about your love of the dark web. Great. And your army of poppers fueled spies who are just looking across the world. So right. you right now, what do you find to be the most interesting countercultural or subversive artistic trends? Hmm. Well, certainly had the hackers and you know the dark web thing, but I don't know, and I wouldn't know how to get on any of those sites. I would have no idea, and then it would infect my computer. I would be so terrified. I, I'm so worried that with Google, because now every day I get all the news stories that I don't ask for, and they are all about Michael Jackson, Manson. Like I think, how did they know that? I'm afraid like my favorite porn sites are going to flash up on a billboard as I drive by <laughs> because of you all. <laughs> So, <laughs> do you, I mean, maybe there's something to that. The once once we're all out and all of our porn sites are on a billboard, is, isn't that kind of liberating? Maybe, but you know, sometimes I'm so afraid to click on any porn site today because you think of that exact reason, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, hackers, what they should do is go find your political enemies and publish all the porn sites that they looked at. Imagine if Trump's porn or you know any of them who you don't like listed what porn they looked at. It would be, I guess. And I know people that have been on their computer where the, they sees it and everything, and they can see you and talk to you and stuff, which I was amazed. I didn't know that could happen. Yeah, that little yeah. black dot at yeah, the yeah, top yeah, of the yeah. laptop. Always put it turns out, over, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> turns out that's a camera. Yeah. Um, what you, I mean, but maybe it humanizes people if we all knew this about each other. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Who knows? I mean, it is amazing to me that you can just Google the, the most filthy porn thing, and it comes right up. You can look at it <laughs> for free. You're welcome. <laughs> For free, yeah. I know. And porn without paying for it, it needs a little guilt. <laughs> I think free porn is wrong. <laughs> Yet another teacher. <laughs> so, <coughs> shifting topics, and uh, my, my boss is happy for that. Um, <laughs> You've, uh, it's been reported that you've got like somewhere between eight and 10,000 books around your I house. I think I have 11,000. 11, yeah. okay. But in all my homes. In all the, no, no, not all so um, what, what, what are you reading right now? Uh, Clarice, what's her name, the Brazilian <coughs> novelist that I'm obsessed with. What's her name? <laughs> yes, who I'm obsessed by because she writes whole books about nothing, about the moment when you don't think about anything and go, uh, the whole novel's about that moment. <laughs> <laughs> really good. <laughs> um, what? I'm reading Moby's new book. That's next. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I heard Moby was just did this in uh, in, uh, in Cambridge. It, yeah, yeah. Google. Yeah. You got him here? Uh, not not in New York. Uh, yeah, he's he's a little too cool for New York. <laughs> um, what books do you come back to? What what are what are your rereads? Well, I think I wrote in role models. My favorite ones are Denton Welsh. I really love. Mm -hmm. I love. Um, uh, Oh, God, what's her name? I'm just going blank. Uh, um, Paul Bowles is what Jane Bowles, I really like her. So these books are ones that, that are not that well known, but they're my very favorite ones. And I, I certainly write about all of them in there. They're all in print. Two Serious Ladies is my favorite novel ever. And In Youth is Pleasure by Dunn Welsh, those two. Okay. Any that haven't held up over time? 
Hmm. Yeah, some of that 60s radical stuff. You know, you look at it today and it's just, you know, I never liked, who was the drunk? Uh, well, the one that always <laughs> wrote about the uh, Bukowski. Bukowski. I never liked him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't like him then, but now yeah. everybody likes him, and I still don't like him. Yeah. Uh, I tried to go back recently and do Kerouac and realize, like, mm. well, Kerouac, yeah. I mean, in a way, in a way. When everybody thinks on the roads about hitchhiking, they're not hitchhiking, you know, except for a short time. All right. And of all of the questions I put out, the one that, that most consistently came back, so right. this is the groundswell, um, John Travolta, Harvey Firestein, Divine, who was the best Edna Turnblad? Always Divine, because yeah. Divine was the template. Yeah. Divine was the, Divine was the template. And I think Harvey was absolutely fabulous in it. And I, I think I said this somewhere, but he, the opening night on Broadway, Harvey's mother, who I had never met, my parents had never met, came over to my mother and said, didn't we raise terrific sons? <laughs> <laughs> It was really kind of That's great. really all you could want really in the great. world. And John Travolta, people gave me a lot of shit. They were always Scientologists. Well, he never, we never talked about it. But they say, well, if Scientologists, they claim that they don't dislike gay people. But even if the ones that, be, that are gay, that become Scientologists because they hate being gay, well, good. They just won't make somebody a bad boyfriend. <laughs> Let them have them. Let them have them. <laughs> What's the matter with that? Yeah. It seems as a, a good a, a solution as any. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank very, you all very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.